today, we'll, we'll use the little time, the time that we have to talk about uh, Earth of White. But the real question for me, Earth of White, uh, many of you may know, uh, is a Jacksonville kind of icon. Um, she, uh, just to tell you a little bit about her, she was born in uh, November of 1876. Uh, she was uh, probably the product of the union of a white master and his uh, 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 black um, uh, housekeeper. Uh, she was adopted by Clara White. Clara White and her husband, uh, Lafayette White, were um, formerly enslaved persons. Uh, Clara White um, had 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 tried to have children many, many, many times before. She had uh, 12 miscarriages, at least, that we know of. Um, and so when Eartha came along and was offered to her for adoption, uh, Clara and her husband were thrilled to have the opportunity to, um, to adopt her. And they raised her and Eartha White, this is a, a, a nice picture of Eartha um, and Clara together. Um, and then um, Eartha had a very long uh, life. This is a picture of her um, toward the end of her life. Um, she died at age 97 um, after a very distinguished career. Um, and many, so many of you probably know a little bit about her, but for me, the question is, uh, you know, the way that uh, Oeen and this series is set up is it is, uh, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, but, and these are people that are recognized by the church, um, I'll just say the Episcopal church, um, as people who are, who are special saints, who are uh, people who are, who are, who shed the light of Christ uh, on, for us. Uh, Eartha White is not on any list. Um, she's not in the Book of Common Prayer. She's not in a great cloud of witnesses. She's not in any official um, Episcopal list of persons that we look to as saints. Um, and so my question kind of this morning is, well, who is a saint? Um, you know, how do, what do we mean by that term? So I wanna talk a little bit about that and give y'all plenty of time to talk about it. First of all, if you pray with me, though, this is from uh, the Book of Common Prayer. Um, so, O oh God, the King of Saints, we praise and glorify your holy name for all your servants who have finished their course in your faith and fear, for the Blessed Virgin Mary, for the holy patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and for all your other righteous servants, known to us and unknown, and we pray that encouraged by their examples, aided by their prayers, and strengthened by their fellowship, we also may be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light through the merits of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, that is the, just the comment of saints um, from the Book of Common Prayer. Um, so you'll notice that there is kind of a mixture there of the theology of, you know, who is a saint? Um, the church has uh, for many, for a long, long time, uh, recognized particular people. Uh, there's always St. Paul and St. John and, you know, St. Peter and all those guys. Um, but we also uh, notice that this prayer says, for all your other righteous servants, known to us and unknown. Um, and the, the key idea is we pray that encouraged by their examples, aided by their prayers and strengthened by their fellowship, we also may be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. I would suspect, and I'm just being very presumptuous, but I would suspect that although, you know, many of us are, uh, have a favorite saint, maybe the Blessed Virgin Mary, maybe it's St. Paul, maybe it's St. John, but I bet you that uh, the saints that really brought you closest to Christ might be your grandmother um, or your dad or one of your grandchildren in <laughs> Oeen's case this morning. 
Um, so who are so who are the saints? Um, I wanted also to make sure that we kind of keep the graphic um, that Owen has brought before us from last week of the importance of telling our stories and how does our how do how do the various stories fit together? Um, you know, so my story and each of our stories is all part of our story, the, you know, the group identity and loyalty that expand our sense of self and what, how does that all fit into the story? I won't go back to that a whole lot other than to just suggest that this is, you know, a lot of what we're talking about now. So let me talk just a little bit about the saints in the Episcopal Church. Um, one thing I wanted to do, uh, because I love this song, and because I think this is a wonderful little version of this song, um, is uh, get you moving. I want to encourage you to sing, although it'd be nice to have mute, your mute on when you do that, although some of you can sing a lot better than I can. Uh, I promise I will not be uh, singing on this, but here we go. I sing a song of the saints of God, hopefully. We can't hear it, Joe. Oh. Do you, do okay, you I'm sorry. So you can't hear it? Uh-uh. Oh, that's terrible. It's a wonderful little version. Oh, well. Oh. Um, I won't try to figure out what I've done wrong. Um, I apologize. You didn't mute yourself, did you? No. Okay. What do you think? What do you think happened? That Were would be... You, and you don't have headphones on. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Hmm. Well. We need Michael. He can figure all this stuff out. Yeah, now I'm. We could hear something. Try it and then put the vol, turn your volume up maybe. Okay. Well, let me try it again. Okay. No. Shucks. Well, we could probably all sing it, but we definitely mute ourselves in. Oh well. Um, well, I will. I hope you'll just accept my 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 comment that it's a lovely version, um, and I think it's wonderful. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, well, that's, that's a loss. I'd rather you hear the, the, the children's choir of this church in uh, New Haven, actually, in Connecticut. Um, they just have a lovely version. So I encourage you to, uh, to listen to this, uh, you know, in your leisure. Um, so, oh dear, what have I done? How do I get back? Well, okay. Anyways, the if you look at the if you look at the words to the song, um, uh, this song was written uh, by Lesbia Scott, who is an English uh, mother uh, who typically wrote songs for her children. And she didn't even like this song all that much, but for some reason, this song really caught on. Uh, it was set to a hymn tune uh, in 1940 uh, by John Henry Hopkins. Uh, John Henry Hopkins, I don't really know, but his grandfather wrote uh, We Three Kings of Orient Are, blah, blah, blah. Um, so he has a little bit of musical talent in his family. So anyway, I sing a song of the saints of God, patient and brave and true, who toiled and fought and lived and died for the Lord they loved and knew. And one was a doctor, and one was a queen, and one was a shepherdess on the green. They were all of them saints of God, and I mean, God helping to be one too. And the idea is, is that, you know, the saints that are being talked about are, again, people who are very specially, uh, are very special for each of us, 
uh, in leading us and being examples of us for, for being uh, Christian. Um, so the Book of Common Prayer, as you all know, has a calendar of the holy days, um, including all sorts of things. But there's also, um, you know, included in there some specific uh, saints, uh, and there are pretty, a pretty limited number of people. Um, but there are collects for holy days and the common of saints, all, all of that. So the concept of saints is certainly uh, included in the Episcopal Church. Um, in the Baptist Church that I grew up, we wouldn't even be talking about this language. We wouldn't be using this language. We, we certainly would be talking perhaps about the same concept, but the language would be different. And if we're in the in the Catholic Church, and it's a shame that Michael's not uh, not here with us because he could help enlighten me at least um, on this. But the idea of the saints in the Catholic Church is a little bit different than it is in the Episcopal Church. So we're talking about again a via media kind of approach to uh, the saints, um, and 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 the uh, General Convention um, several years ago decided, and I think, Owen, you've talked about this in the first class on this, but there is a, 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 a publication called A Great Cloud of Witnesses. It's available online. Um, and basically, uh, it recognizes the value of using the term saints to refer to both the whole church, all of us, we're the saints, and also to special individuals like St. Augustine or St. Paul or whoever. Um, but one of the things that really struck me is that it kind of in one of the appendices to a great cloud of witnesses, there is a little idea that says, well, you know, just because somebody is not recognized by the Episcopal church, by the church as a whole, it may well be that there are saints, you know, that a diocese would recognize or perhaps a particular congregation would, would recognize. And so my and, and they indicate that the criteria for additions to a great cloud of witnesses, if you want to get them included on the calendar of the Episcopal Church, include these various um, uh, these various uh, concepts. Um, so, for example, is there uh, is are they historical? Um, have they uh, so the historicity? Do they uh, uniquely and identifiably tell a Christian story, um, are they significant? Um, they don't have to be extraordinary or even heroic. We're not talking about superheroes necessarily, but we're talking about somebody whose story is certainly extraordinary. Um, and one of the things that I note is, is that the range of inclusion. So the church is trying to encourage um, noting people who are relatively modern um, and, and recognizing people who aren't even Episcopalian, which is nice because the person I'm gonna be talking about in just a minute is Eartha White, who, whose uh, church life was tied up with Bethel Baptist Church in Jacksonville. Um, and so she is not an Episcopalian. Uh, she died only 45 or six years ago. Um, and um, and so a lot of people would say, well, you know, what are we talking about her for? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. So let's talk just a little bit about Eartha White. Unfortunately, um, it seems like, well, let me try one more little, let me try one more little clip. And if this doesn't work, then I just apologize. Um, no? Can you hear this? We can hear you, Joe, but we can't hear it. Oh, well. Oh, well. I can cut and paste it and you go on and then I can tell you when I've got it and put it up on the screen. Um, that's okay. That, that's okay. I will, I will just try to tell you. Um, it would have been nice for you again to hear this was a, the clip that I was uh, going to show you if I could have. Um, 
uh, was from uh, Channel 12 uh, on their Women's History Month uh, a year or so ago. Keitha Nelson, uh, the, uh, one of the news anchors for the morning program, uh, was talking about uh, Clara White. Um, she was using the same picture, and in a minute, she, you know, got, told the story, told a story about Clara White uh, being um, uh, who, who was who had an um, an interesting birth story. We've talked a little bit about that, um, and who throughout her life used the her abilities, which were considerable, to make things better for a lot of people. Um, she was, like I said, she was born in November of 1876. She died in 1974. We talked about uh, her adoption. Uh, and one of the things that's important to note is that she was, when she, uh, if you go to the Clara White Mission Museum, you'll see a little bit um, about her background. And you'll notice that she's very talented she was a wonderful lyric soprano. She toured as an opera singer, you know, for a while. Then she came back to Jacksonville and she got back to Jacksonville um, in time for, or just around the time that the Great Fire of 1901 occurred. And so what she did was say, you know, um, all of Jacksonville is, has an opportunity to start over. Um, and we need to start over, uh, and we need to address the needs that are um, that are in evidence um, in Jacksonville. And so, at the age of 24, 25, or well, let's see, she was born in '76. So this, yes, she, so the fire happened when she was about 24, 25. Within the next year, she established a what was called the uh, colored old folks home um, in uh, the Oakland area in North Jackson or in, in North Jacksonville. Um, and she managed to both provide from her own funds uh, and from funds that she raised from other people um, for the maintenance and upkeep of a number of uh, elderly uh, African-American uh, persons who uh, would otherwise have not had a place to be. Um, two years later, she founded the Clara White Mission. Notice she didn't call it the Eartha White Mission, she called it after her mother, the Clara White Mission, because her mother was an in, an, uh, a tremendous influence, Christian influence on Eartha and her upbringing. And that sounded all fine, but she was engaged to be married, but her husband, uh, her, her fiance died of tuberculosis. Uh, he was a railroad um, employee, a porter, um, and he died of tuberculosis. And after that, she devoted herself to humanity. Um, and that's what she did. So I'm not even gonna try to play the next little clip, um, which is about a seven minute piece which is an interview by some FSCJ students with Pat Bell, who um, is kind of the director and curator of the Clara White uh, Mission Museum uh, and is really an expert on the life of, uh, of Eartha White. Um, Joe, Joe, yes. these clips that you have, uh -huh. are they are all lit up. So it appears that they are connected. I don't know why it's not working but they'll be on the recording, which will be on the website. And so we could go back and watch them. Yeah, and I promise you, I promise you that I've actually tried these, you know, to play them from the, uh, you know, from the uh, uh, PowerPoint slides and they did work, but yeah. I'm not smart know. enough to know, you know, how to, how to get them all to work. Uh, it's it's so too cold in Jacksonville right now, probably. Maybe that's it, that must be it, that must be it. But this little clip tells you um, about some of her career. And so among the things that you would find um, is the story of her adoption that she, she always had the notion that she was born to do special things. In fact, um, 
a local FSCJ writer uh, who, if you're not familiar with, he writes a lot about local history and his name is Tim Gilmore. And he's written a number of books. And one of his books is Earth of White, A Storehouse for the People uh, or A Storehouse for Humanity. And he starts off his book uh, telling how uh, a very, uh, very elderly Baptist minister came to Clara White before Eartha White was even born and said, you are your, the next, your, your baby. And she said, what baby? I've had 12 miscarriages and I don't have any babies. and I don't, I'm not pregnant or anything. But he said, no, just hush, you know, your baby is going to be named Eartha because she is going to be very special. She is going to be someone who is going to devote her life to humanity. Now, I don't know whether that's historically true, but he repeats the story. And in fact, it kind of plays into what actually happened. Um, and so kind of miraculously, you know, Eartha showed up in Clara and Lafayette's life and, uh, and then she devoted herself to, um, to humanity, basically. She was a teacher. Uh, many of you probably, or if you're from Jacksonville, I know not everybody is, but if you're from Jacksonville, you know that she taught, she founded and basically built a school down in the Bayard area, down in the very southern part of Jacksonville near St. John's County. And unfortunately, the school was demolished to make way for yet another road in Jacksonville. Um, but there was, there, it was not able to be saved. Uh, but she started uh, teaching in a, in a small little school. She moved to teach in Stanton School, the principal for which at the time was James Weldon Johnson. Um, and at a time when James Weldon Johnson wrote um, Lift Every Voice and Sing, which I would love for us to have sung. And it's on the, on the website. And there's a little clip of it. Uh, and the clip is nice because it's not, it's a, it's a good little version, but it's also got the lyrics. So you can see the lyrics as you're singing along. Um, there, there's some wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, uh, YouTube clips for Lift Every Voice and Sing. And it, well, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, then I certainly encourage you to, to look at it because this was a song that was uh, very important in Eartha's life. Uh, it was sung at every occasion that she uh, had to celebrate, which were considerable. Um, when the Claire White Mission was opened, when it was, well, not when it was opened originally, but when it was reconstructed after a fire, um, you know, when she got awards, uh, it, a number of different points in time, that's the song that was sung. And I'm glad to see, and I certainly hope that, um, the current effort that I read about in the paper just in the last few days to, to have Lift Every Voice and Sing recognized as a national hymn, um, certainly hope that that will uh, bear good fruit in, in America. It, uh, it's just such a wonderful, wonderful hymn. She, so she taught, but she not only did that, she was a secretary for the African-American, Afro-American Life Insurance Company, which was a very successful insurance company in Jacksonville back in the day. Um, she had a lot of business acumen and it's, and it's estimated by some historians that she made over a million dollars. And we're talking about when a when million dollars was really a lot of money. Um, and basically gave everything away. Um, she lived in the mission, uh, in her soup kitchen, where all the work was done at Clara White Mission, which is on, six, it, it, on West Ashley Street downtown, and still is. Um, and she basically gave everything away. She founded a baseball team, a minor league baseball team uh, in the Negro Leagues. She founded... Um, you know, a laundry and any number of other businesses. And then she sold them. And that's where she got the money to give away. And that's what she did. Um, one of the uh, uh, incidents or thing or historical events that she's particularly involved in was she was part of the Negro Women's Club movement. And 
in the early 1900s uh, for women uh, in America, uh, women were lob you know, were working hard to get the right to vote and did a lot of stuff through women's club movements. But there was a big separation, of course, between white women's clubs and uh, Negro women's clubs. And she was very involved in, uh, in her uh, women's club. And in 19, uh, 1919, when the, um, uh, when the, I'm sorry, when the 19th Amendment was uh, approved and women uh, were, were given, well, not were given, but had the, got the right to vote, um, she became very involved in registering black women and black men uh, to vote in the 1920 election, which was going to be the next presidential and, you know, state elections at which women were able to vote, you know, en masse for the first time. But remember, of course, that this was also a time when, um, when whites uh, in Jacksonville, most always, were going to do everything that they possibly could to maintain the power of what was then the Democratic Party, um, which was the white party at that time. Um, and so I won't go into the details of all the things that happened through the KKK and through others to, uh, to disenfranchise basically um, blacks at that point. But Eartha White was, and part of the reason why it became important for whites to do that was because Eartha White and others, Mary Bethune, also was part of this as well, were very successful in getting uh, black women particularly to register to vote. And the election was gonna turn out quite different if, they, if their votes were counted. Unfortunately, well, that's, you know, we all know what, what happened. Uh, very soon after that, she became the Florida director of the National Anti-Lynching League uh, in Florida. Um, she's been a longtime member of Bethel Baptist Church, uh, or she was, and uh, she was recognized nationally for her volunteer efforts. She became a national volunteer leader. Uh, she was uh, uh, recognized by President Richard Nixon uh, for her efforts. Um, and so she has been involved all through her life as a humanitarian. And I would say that if you know um, the Clara White mission now, you'll know that Jacoby Pittman, who is the director of Clara White mission now, and all those who are involved in Clara White mission continue to do the work that Miss White, Eartha White, you know, started. Um, and so, and all of this is done um, as, a, in a, as a response to how do we make the lives of people better and what would Jesus have us do to, do, to accomplish that? Um, so, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at, I'll leave it at that. Um, so Owen has started us with some wonderful questions. Um, for example, where in your story were you sent home by another way? Uh, not only Elizabeth Seaton, but the wise men, you know, that started this series, uh, you know, all of them. And so another question is when, when or where in your life did a seemingly tragic event, uh, as in the case of the death of Miss White's fiance, lead you in a due direction for good. Um, and so I, you've heard quite enough from me. Um, if I'd, I'd love to hear from you in response to your thoughts about Eartha White, in response to your question is, do you think Eartha White should be a saint recognized by the Episcopal Church? Um, I think she should, but I know people can disagree with that. Um, and, um, and what other question or what other answers do you have to these questions? So I can't see all of you, but um, I'd love to hear from you. Joe, if you stop sharing the screen, well, you want to leave those questions up, don't you? Okay. Well, it does, yeah. Yeah, you can also go to the view and, and go to side by side speaker, I think maybe. No, that won't work side-by-side -side gallery. So we just use the arrows to go up and down. There oh, oh there you are, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. 
Uh, Joe, this is Bet Betsy Towers. I was yes, thinking when you were reading the questions that uh, uh, maybe a saint is a person who takes whatever hardship life deals and can uh, refocus and, and turn their life into something for the good of many, like these Arthur White did and uh, Elizabeth Seton. So it's, it's a little bit more than just ordinary people. In answer to your original question, what is a saint? It's more than just an ordinary person, someone who can change the tide of their life based on whatever hardship has been dealt. Disappointment. Right. So uh, based on what little I've told you about uh, Eartha White, and I'm sure what you know, Betsy, uh, being a, a wonderful Jacksonville resident, um, what do you think? Do you think Eartha White might qualify as a, as a saint? When Linda did her series, uh, Jonathan Daniels, is, is that his name? I mean, he just, he haunts me in a good way. And so my, my bar <laughs> is really, really high. But, but uh, uh, Eartha White certainly is, is a steady force. I mean, she, she didn't... Uh, participate in revolutions or anything like that in, in a big uh, outstanding way like somebody like uh, Jonathan Daniels did. But, but she was steady and she did it in her own way. And I, I really commend that just like I, I do what Daniels did. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I think of that, that Timothy verse about I stayed the course, fought the fight, and, and uh, maybe that equals a saint. Could be. Thank you. I appreciate that. I wonder if we're a little bit um, misdirected when we use the term saint as opposed to one of the great cloud of witnesses because um, that's just such a, a broader explanation of what we're looking for is people to lift up and to raise up as um, leaders in our spiritual life. Um, I just, I, I am so grateful to Joe for pointing out that section in the Great Cloud of Witnesses book that says, what these there are other people who qualify for this and we the we the the people are entitled to raise those people up and so because of joe we did mary mary bethune and now eartha white and all of us who have been involved in this have our radars out looking for more local people especially like that I also like the fact, Joe, that um, the expansion goes beyond our, you know, our own tribe, the Episcopal tribe. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I studied um, art with a man whose name was Tom Lewis, who was part of the Plowshares group. And I didn't know that when I first started to study printmaking oh. with him. And he would get arrested on a regular basis because he was off doing some protest against uh, use of nuclear power. He, he was with the Berrigan brothers. And it was the first, yeah, my introduction into seeing faith through art, through the art of, through the artist for, particularly. Uh, Tom had a, a great ability to, <clears throat> to put his faith in the midst of his, his incredible uh, prints. And that he died way too young, um, but he's always been a saint for me. Uh, he would get arrested, as I said, on a regular basis. Um, one time when he was arrested at a protest in New York City, 
he used the mayonnaise from the bologna sandwich he was given and mixed it with the dirt of the cell and drew portraits of the people with whom he was in jail. And um, he did the he did the prints for Dan Berrigan's book on Ezekiel too, but he, he, there was just a way in which I was seeing um, a lot of light through him that affected or tried to affect the, the lives of others. He lived in the tradition of Dorothy Day in the Catholic Worker Movement House in Worcester, Massachusetts, and would from time to time offer what he called a street mass uh, for the people from the soup kitchen. And I was fortunate enough to preside at one of those. Um, he's, he's a local Massachusetts saint, as far as I'm concerned. And it was my privilege to know him and, to be, and to be taught by him. Yeah. Celeste, you were you unmuted. I hope that means you were going to say something. <laughs> no, I got confused about that. Oh. Technology. No, I'm good. Um, okay. One of the things that I really liked about what you pointed out about Eartha White, and, and it was true about Elizabeth Seton too, Joe, is, is that the, the great hardship in, in early life, um, and not only for her, but for Clara White in 12 miscarriages, and, and of course, then the prophecy that she would that she would have this child named Eartha, but that, that qualification, if you call it that, I suspect puts all of us in the category of being ones that, um, that have risen above a, a, a difficult, difficult situation and, and gone forward. Um, and I, I just think that makes it a very inclusive great cloud of witnesses. So I'm so glad you brought that up. That we're not we're not revolutionaries. We, you know, we didn't go to prison for what we believed yet. Um, but but I I suspect everybody on this screen has hit the wall before and had to bounce off and you know change paradigms go in another direction, start all over again. And when we can achieve that, only because of the grace of God, perhaps, I think that's, that puts us into that cloud, so. Well, well, <clears throat> well, thank you for the opportunity to, you know, to, to share her. I know that, that she is not on a list. Um, she's not one of those, but Having been raised Baptist, even though I said that, you know, our language isn't to talk about saints, um, uh, it is to recognize uh, the characteristics of what we would call it. And, and I mean, I think I, I appreciate your clarification about the gray cloud of witnesses. But I would note, you know, that the language in the church, in the, in the church's uh, publication is, you know, the gray cloud of witnesses is, you know, a a group of people who are the saints and so there is this you know so there's maybe that maybe the language is something that i need to get over <laughs> you know to use dean kate's one of her book titles and so forth just need to get over it um and not worry so much about exactly what to call people but recognize the influence that they've had you know in in our lives so and I'll just, I'll just, I'll, maybe I'll close with one other last thing. And this is about Betsy's dad. Um, because to me, uh, I, I mean, I practiced in his law firm for, well, I, st I still do. I don't know why I'm still there. Um, but um, anyway, but for me, Charlie Towers was a saint in many ways. There are a lot of people who would say, well, I don't know. You, you know, sometimes I'm wondering about that. But for me, you know, the way he conducted his life, the way he practiced law, uh, and the way he ran the law firm, and the way that he lived his life, I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm brought closer to Christ as a result of having been in contact, uh, sometimes closer than I wanted to be, but with, uh, but with Charlie Towers. Um, 
And like I say, you know, my grandmothers, you know, if I'm thinking about people that are truly saints for me, um, they're way up there. My wife, I don't know of a person that's more saintly to me than her. Uh, I'm way down the list as far as that's concerned, but I got a lot of good, a, a, good, a lot of good examples. So um, I'm not going to try to go back to the screen, but if you'll just pray with me, as because I know our time is getting real late. Um, again, this is from the comment of a saint, uh, and this is from a great cloud of witnesses. So, um, so Almighty God, by Your Holy Spirit, You've made us one with Your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by the, this fellowship of love and prayer and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So, go in peace. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. And everybody, look at look at the uh, video online, the recording, and you can go and get the um, the links from there. So, thank you. Next week is Michael Corrigan and um, is it Anselm? Oh, uh, Anthony. Anthony. It's Anthony of the of Egypt. That's right. That's right. Have a peaceful week. Same to you. Blessings. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.